ready for takeoff. Hello, my name is Mike Topa, um, and I'll tell you a bit about my a bit more about myself in a minute. But first, I want to make a comment that's directed to the RubyConf attendees who are not in the room right now uh, and are watching the recording of this talk later. I don't blame you for going to Aaron, Aaron Patterson's talk instead of mine. Um, <laughs> Aaron has been one of the most popular RubyConf speakers over the years. And when I saw the schedule, I said, oh no, we're at the same time. Um, but I appreciate you watching the recording later. And for everyone here in the room now, I appreciate you being here with me today. Uh, my talk is called From Beginner to Expert and Back Again. And I'll give you a quick overview so you can decide if you want to stay for the whole thing. The Japanese term shoshin translates as beginner's mind and refers to a paradox. The more you know about a subject, the more likely you are to close your mind to further learning. The teaching of Zen monk Shunryu Suzuki are collected in the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And the most well-known quote from it is, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. He goes on to say that, once we decide we know everything, we shut down opportunities to learn. In contrast, the beginner state of mind is judgment-free. It's open, curious, available, and present. Suzuki says it's like a small child, full of curiosity and wonder and amazement. The beginner's mind embodies the emotional qualities of enthusiasm, creativity, and optimism. These qualities are important for creative problem solving and for innovation. I'll share a simple example of beginner's mind from a previous work experience. We had a scheduled job that ran nightly that did a variety of financial transactions, and there was an automatic summary that was sent to a Slack channel every morning, and it included various statistics. This summary report had been in place for years, and we routinely checked it every morning. But a little while after we hired a new team member, he said, hey, I think one of these numbers isn't right. So we took a look, and sure enough, the math was pretty obviously wrong for an important part of the report. It took a new person to notice this fairly obvious problem. The rest of us never noticed it because it was familiar and, we, and had been around a long time. So we were confident in it and no longer were curious about it or questioned it. We had an expert's mind. But he saw the error because he was new and everything was unfamiliar to him. So he was curious and wasn't shy about asking questions. He had a beginner's mind. So that's it. That's the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, we have a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about the benefits of having a beginner's mind and the pitfalls of sustaining it as we gain expertise. We'll look at some examples outside of the world of software development, like how it took decades and an entire generation of expert geologists to die before the theory of continental drift was taken seriously, and why plane crashes happen more often when the senior pilot is flying, not the junior pilot. Then we'll draw lessons from all of this for our work in software development and in particular, how you can apply some specific strategies with pair programming to sustain a beginner's mind in your work. So that should give you a general sense of where we're going. I'm a believer in what's called the law of two feet at conferences. It's perfectly okay to head to another talk if this one isn't for you. Uh, also, as I just mentioned, I will be discussing plane crashes in part of the talk, nothing too intense or anything, but I want to mention it in case it's a topic that might not be comfortable for anyone. So before we dive in, I'll say a little bit more about me. Um, this picture is from my childhood copy of Dr. Seuss's My Book About Me. And to dispel any confusion, I did not grow up to be a policeman like it says here. Um, instead, I've been developing for the web for over 25 years since the days when the first web pages were painted on cave walls. Uh, over the years, I've worked at Ask Jeeves, E-Trade, ActBlue, Stanford University, Georgetown, and the University of Pennsylvania, and others as well. Um, I'm currently a senior engineering manager at Umbu Labs. We're a small software agency that helps enterprises build and scale products designed for growth. And we're best known for our fast Ruby uh, Rails upgrade service. Uh, here are some links where you can find me online and as well as links to the slides. And I'll share these links again at the end of the talk. Um, so let's look at some of the benefits of beginner's mind. One is deeper gratitude. It's easy to lose sight of the many good things in life that lift you up. By seeing your life from a fresh perspective, you can appreciate what you might otherwise take for granted. More creativity. As a developer, you see a similar set of problems time and time again, and habits of thinking become ingrained. 
but deliberately experiencing a problem with the mind of a beginner can provide a fresh perspective on existing challenges. You might even explore opportunities that you didn't previously consider. Greater intention. When you're familiar with something, it's easy to go into autopilot. Beginner's mind helps you slow down to see what you're doing with greater clarity and avoid the drawbacks of mindlessly, you know, just going through the motions. And more fun. Beginner's mind helps you reacquaint yourself with the interesting aspects of everything you do. It can remind you of the reasons why you wanted to be a developer in the first place. So how do we get there? How do we cultivate the beginner's mind? Um, one is letting go of preconceptions about how things are going to work and what will happen. And then always starting with curiosity, not assumptions, to understand things more deeply. Opening yourself to new possibilities and asking simple questions. Children are natural at these things because they're always beginners at something. But as you get older, it's easy to lose touch with these qualities of mind that once came so naturally. Um, but let's dig into this a little further by looking at some of the obstacles that beginners have with cultivating beginner's mind. The first one that we'll talk about is deference to authority. You may be hesitant to speak up with a concern or an idea with your boss or someone senior to you. There's a relevant chapter on this in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, The Story of Success. A key theme of the book is that outcomes we often attribute to the abilities or mistakes of individual people are often better explained by looking at systemic or environmental factors. Now, before I go any further, you're probably having one of three possible reactions to hearing Gladwell's name. If you haven't heard of him, you're probably just curious to hear more. If you know his work and like it, then you're probably intrigued that I mentioned him. Or if you're familiar with some of the critiques of his work, you may be rolling your eyes. Those critiques are important, and I promise I will come back to them later in the talk. But getting back to the book for now, Gladwell has a chapter examining why planes crash. There are, of course, many possible reasons. The one he focuses on is poor communication among the cockpit crew. There's typically a captain and a first officer who is the co-pilot. And then during a flight, the first officer is flying the plane, and sometimes the captain's flying the plane. Typically, the captain has more experience. And a common communication problem when there are different levels of seniority between the two pilots is that the junior pilot uses what's called mitigated speech in addressing the senior pilot. What happens is that the junior pilot is being deferential to the authority of the senior pilot. This happens with developers, too. The junior person will typically communicate using hints if they think the senior person is doing something wrong or overlooking something. They worry that using a more direct approach might be seen as confrontational or insubordinate or that they'll embarrass themselves if they're wrong. But the problem is, a hint is the hardest kind of request to decode and the easiest to refuse. Let's take, an let's take a look at an example from the book. In the 1982 crash of Air Florida Flight 90, the plane had a problem with wing ice before takeoff. This is a serious problem. It can affect the lift force of the wings and lead to loss of control of the plane. The quotes shown here are from the black box recordings recovered after the crash. And this is the first officer talking before takeoff. He doesn't speak in a direct manner to the captain who is serving as the pilot for takeoff. Instead, he drops hints that he's seeing a serious problem with ice on the wings. This is literally a life and death situation. Yet he does not come out and say something really direct like, I strongly advise against takeoff. I'm concerned the wing ice will make us lose control and, and crash. Instead, he's just dropping these, these hints. And right after takeoff, the plane crashed into Washington, D.C.'s 14th Street Bridge and fell into the Potomac River. Gladwell presents numerous examples very similar to this, where the junior pilot and other crew members notice a very serious problem, but don't speak clearly or directly to the captain about it, and then the plane crashes. Plane crashes are always thoroughly investigated, and what's been found is that crashes are more common with the captain in the flying seat. This may seem counterintuitive, but planes are safer when the least experienced pilot is flying because it means the second, more experienced pilot isn't going to be afraid to speak up if there's a problem. So a lesson here for senior developers is that you can counteract this problem by being good mentors. You can be kind, solicitous, an active listener, patient, humble, and encouraging. A great way to start is pair programming, but let the junior developer drive and you can get the same benefits as pilots the junior person learns, and the senior person provides guidance. I realize the words on the slide here are just platitudes. If you're at Kelly Ryan's talk this morning on pair programming, she provided a lot of specific advice on how to act on these intentions. 
If you weren't there, I recommend checking out the recording when it's online. And I'll also have more to say about pair programming towards the end of the talk. For junior developers, um, a lesson is that you have an asset no one else has, the beginner's mind. When you see something that looks like a problem in the code, in your workflow, or something else, or you have a new idea, I encourage you to communicate clearly, but of course politely. Doing so can be intimidating for the reasons I just mentioned and other reasons I'll get to in a moment. But as a new person in an organization, you haven't yet become acculturated into this is how we've always done things, which can cause senior people in your organization to develop blind spots, like the example I gave at the start of the talk. You may see problems no one else will see or have insights that will not occur to anyone else. So that all sounds nice, but let's also talk about some other beginner's obstacles to beginner's mind. The encouragement I just provided about speaking up is easy to say, but not always easy to do. Speaking up when you see a problem or asking simple questions, like I mentioned earlier, can be intimidating. If you're new and trying to find your place in a team or organization, you may worry a simple question might sound like a dumb question, and not just because of deference to authority. Personally, I can feel comfortable speaking up in a group and asking what might seem like a dumb question and not feel too much like I'll be judged by it. I was a little nervous about this when I was younger, but you know, I would still speak up. And that comfort level I've always had is more, reflection, more a reflection of my privilege than anything else. Another challenge is just how hard it can be when you're starting out. In a blog post titled What Beginner's Mind Is Really Like by Robert Heaton, he offers a valid critique of all this beginner's mind stuff. He says, I have no idea what to do next. I don't think that anyone who encourages the cultivation of a beginner's mind has ever actually met a beginner. Am I good yet? When will I know if I'm good? I need to be good by tomorrow at the latest. I don't think I'm good yet. The example I gave earlier of a new coworker pointing out a reporting problem was someone who was new to the organization but already had the experience and confidence to speak up about a problem he saw. What if instead this is your first job and you see the problem but think there's maybe another aspect of it you're not aware of and you'll worry you'll embarrass yourself if you say something? Really the only answer here is that it's not you, it's them. When you're starting out, your employer should be giving you clear goals and the support you need to achieve them. If you're starting a job and don't know what you're supposed to do next, who to ask for help, or how you'll know if you're doing well, that's not your fault. It means you're experiencing a poor onboarding process. It also means you probably don't have a capable mentor, like I was describing a moment ago. I'm not going to read through the details in the slide, but it's showing data on how much more successful, dedicated, and happy employees are when they have a good onboarding experience. When you're a beginner, you need that supportive environment with clear and achievable goals to be successful. And when you have that, it's a win-win for you and for your employer. And this segues nicely to talking about experts' obstacles to beginner's mind. The experts are the people who are responsible for your onboarding experience in shaping the organization's culture. A business leader who fosters a culture that is unsupportive, closed-minded, and hostile to inquisitiveness or alternative, alternative points of view is leading a business that may not last very long. IT strategy consultant Eric Dietrich calls these kinds of leaders expert beginners. They think they're experts, but they're actually beginners. In the case of Mr. Musk here, he's not seeing that his success running one type of business doesn't necessarily translate very well to a, a different kind of business. Dietrich says, the common thread in a stagnant or toxic work culture is that you have a person or people in positions of authority that have the culturally lethal combination of not knowing much, not knowing what they don't know, and assuming that due to their, ex their own expertise, anything they don't know isn't worth knowing. There's no better ex example of this kind of hubris than the ge geological community's decades-long rejection of Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift. Geologists are scientists, right? We expect them to dispassionately examine, examine evidence and reach logical conclusions, right? But like the rest of us, they are human, which means pride and ego also play a role. And a key trap of expertise is getting stuck looking at things a certain way and not being open to new perspectives. Wegener was not a geologist. He was an Arctic explorer, a record-setting balloonist, and a specialist in meteorology and astronomy. In developing his theory, he cut out maps of the continents stretching them to show how they might have looked before the landscape crumpled up into mountain ranges. Then he fit them together on a globe like jigsaw puzzle pieces to form the supercontinent he called Pangaea. He pointed out how layered geological formations often dropped off on one side of an ocean and picked up again on the other. 
Just as importantly, he looked beyond just geology. He approached the problem with a beginner's mind, not constrained by the traditional divisions between scientific disciplines. He assembled evidence that plants and animals on opposite sides of the oceans were often strikingly similar. It wasn't just that the marsupials in Australia and South America looked alike, so did the flatworms that parasitized them. When his research was translated to English in 1922, the brutal attacks began. His work was rejected as delirious ravings, Germanic pseudoscience. This was right after World War I, so why not you know, attack the Germans? Um, a fairy tale. And worst of all, if we were to believe Wegener's hypothesis, we must forget everything which we have learned in the last 70 years and start all over again. But Wegener took every criticism as an opportunity to refine his theory. He presented several ideas to explain continental drift, and he corrected issues with the initial timeline he presented. But it was only in the 1960s, as older geologists died off, that the next generation took a fresh look at his ideas, which ultimately proved to be correct. So think about that for a second. A whole generation of experts had to die in order for science to advance. There is a missing piece to the puzzle here, though. I just mentioned that Wegener presented ideas to explain specifically how continental drift happened. He actually came up with six different ideas, and one turned out to be very similar to plate tectonics, which we now know is the mechanism for continental drift. But at the time, we had no direct evidence for it or for any of the other explanations he proposed. So while the reactions to his theory were extreme and damaging to the advancement of geology, this particular gap in the evidence for his theory was a valid criticism. So I mentioned earlier that with the beginner's mind, you see the world like a small child, full of curiosity and wonder and amazement. While that is a good thing in and of itself, and we can see it in Wegener's creative and multidisciplinary approach, it's also true that children can be easily fooled. Our critical thinking skills are also important. But how do we find the right balance? How do we harness the knowledge and skills we gain from our experience and apply it to our work and lives without also getting set in our ways and closing off ourselves to new ideas? This brings us back to Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, and the criticisms of it that I mentioned earlier. The book was a number one bestseller for 11 consecutive weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. I read it a few years after it came out. I enjoyed it and felt like I learned some things from it. And there were even teaching materials developed based on the book. But then, in preparing this talk, I came across a bunch of scathing reviews of it, with critics saying, one of these smart-thinking airport books that are super spreader events of American stupidity, a vessel for pseudoscience and fake history, the reasoning and outliers which consist of cherry-picked anecdotes, post hoc sophistry, and false dichotomies had me gnawing on my Kindle. It's high time for Gladwell to produce something more challenging than his beautifully executed tomb robberies of old sociology papers. So Gladwell is an eclectic and original thinker. So what makes these criticisms of his work any different than the attacks we just reviewed on Wegener's continental drift theory? Are these critics also just experts to set in their ways to appreciate Gladwell's novel ideas? Let's take another look at the chapter on plane crashes. The title of that chapter is The Ethnic Theory of Plane Crashes. The example I gave earlier was from an airline based in the US. Well, Gladwell specifically focuses on Korean pilots in most of the chapter and the higher than typical number of crashes that have happened with Korean airlines over, over the years. His argument is that Korean culture is especially deferential to authority and that the nature of the Korean language makes it much more prone to mitigated speech. This post from the Ask a Korean site makes an important point that Cladwell must not have discussed his theory with any actual Koreans. He reviewed the actual transcripts from the black boxes, which are publicly available, and found that Cladwell's argument relied on a highly selective and manipulative use of the evidence, leaving out facts that directly undermined his argument about Korean culture and language. Here's a simple example from the black box of Korean Airlines Flight 801. Cladwell leaves out a quote of the first officer speaking pretty directly about the very poor weather. So on the, on the left is the transcript as Gladwell presented it, and then on the right is the more complete transcript, and the bold text is what uh, uh, Gladwell left out with the first officer saying, Captain, <laughs> Guam condition is no good, which is pretty direct. Um, his analysis has many other examples of Gladwell using information selectively or demonstrating a poor understanding of Korean culture. So a key difference between Wegener and Gladwell is that, although there were gaps in the evidence for Wegener's theory, 
He approached those problems scientifically, systematically, and diligently, refining and adjusting his theory numerous times in response to valid criticisms. In contrast, Gladwell is not as careful, careful or thorough in his research. So where does that leave us? After reading this and the other critiques, why did I still include this chapter from Outliers in my talk as a related concept to beginner's mind? The reason is that although Gladwell, Gladwell's analysis was sloppy, especially concerning Korean culture, the core of his argument has since been more rigorously analyzed, and it turns out to be accurate. The study I uh, put up on the board here uh, examined plane crashes from 68 countries over a 42-year period. The author statistically controlled for a wide variety of factors, such as weather, aircraft, maintenance, and so forth. And they found that cultures that had a greater deference to authority were, in fact, at more risk of plane crashes. I'm discussing this in detail because I want to encourage you to engage in a careful balancing act, to embrace the ideal of the beginner's mind, and at the same time continue to hone your critical thinking skills. The Wegener story about continental drift is a straightforward one. His beginner's mind, eclectic approach, and rigorous thinking led to his insights, and the resistance to his ideas came from experts who were closed-minded. In contrast, the Gladwell story is a more subtle one. He's an out-of-the-box thinker with a beginner's mind, but his approach is not as rigorous, and critics often justifiably pick apart his arguments. Yet the debates about his work drive discussions and knowledge forward. The research article I just cited likely never would have been written if Gladwell hadn't sparked the debate. So whether you're talking with a coworker about which design pattern to use to solve a problem in your code, or you're talking with a friend or relative about politics, you'll find yourself in situations where knowledge, experience, emotion, opinion, logic, authority, and new ideas are all dynamic factors with a continual interplay between them as the conversation unfolds. We want to be open to new ideas, but not get sucked in by bad ideas. We don't want to be fooled by ideas that may suit what we already believe, but actually don't hold up to scrutiny, or close us off to considering new, new approaches. We want evidence to support those new approaches, and we should always be poking and prodding to see just how good the evidence is. So with all of that in mind, let's take a look at a compelling evidence-based approach to achieving the benefits of beginner's mind in software engineering. Arlo Belshi conducted a series of pair programming experiments with the support of his software engineering team. Belshi has been active in the agile software engineering community for many years. They analyzed the results of each variation in their approach to pairing and published the results in a paper titled, Promiscuous Pairing in Beginner's Mind, Embrace Inexperience. Whether you're working alone or in a pair, the usual goal is to enter a state of flow. However, the flow state is fragile. It's easily, easily disrupted by outside distractions or task rotation. And with pairing, there's the additional challenge that it can take days for a new pair to be comfortable enough with each other to achieve flow at all. A common difficulty with beginner's mind is that it's a transitory state. Like the example I gave at the beginning of this talk, the insights gained from the fresh perspective of a new team member fade as that person becomes familiar and comfortable with the environment and loses their beginner's perspective. As Belshi puts it, whereas flow depends on stability, beginner's mind depends on instability. We found that beginner's mind can be maintained as a stable state by simply changing things around frequently enough by surfing the edge of chaos. Let's look at their overall approach. First, it's important to note that this is a team with stable membership developing and supporting a product long-term. So these experiments were limited to that kind of software development environment. They tried several different ways of doing their work, varying how tasks were assigned, how they were scheduled, and who was responsible for them. With an individually owned task, the person responsible for it would still pair, but would never rotate off the task. With a team owned task, the team as a whole was responsible for completing it. Anyone could work on it at any time. The key takeaway from this slide is that the greatest productivity was achieved with the team-based approach, combined with a pull-based system where the team decided what to work on next. They also found they achieved their greatest productivity working in pairs, and by swapping in a new member, pairing on a task every 90 minutes, with no one staying on the task for more than two consecutive sessions. A key insight here is they actually did better by not keeping the person with the most relevant expertise on the task for every session. Why was swapping like this so effective? To quote the article, when people are in beginner's mind, they learn faster and achieve more. Similarly, people tend to be more creative when they only partially understand a situation. 
because they don't know all the limits yet, they don't have as much difficulty seeing past them. Pair churn ensured that every pair had a member in beginner's mind at all times. In the team retrospectives, at first the team members felt like the 90 minute swaps were too frequent. They felt they were getting swapped away just as they were finally getting up to speed on a new problem. And it felt like constantly drinking from a fire hose. And it turns out that's actually the reason they were so productive. As Belshi puts it in the article, after a couple of weeks, everyone saw how much more they were learning than they had ever learned in any situation in their lives. The fire hose became a thrill ride. It became a challenge. An important additional note is how they applied people's skills efficiently in the pairing sessions. As the team members worked together, they became familiar with each other's talents. So if a task called for certain skill, like debugging or writing a complex database query, the team would make sure to include their best bug hunter or their database guru in the pair swaps. Over time, this had the added benefit of enhancing the skills of all the team members as they worked together frequently, accelerating how much and how quickly they learned from each other. Belsey notes that alternating 90-minute swaps caused each pair to contain one person in beginner's mind and another who was teaching the subject. The data show that we were more productive the more promiscuous we were in swapping pairs frequently like this as long as we remained with each partner long enough to exchange knowledge. What the data don't show is that we also had a lot more fun. It took the team a little time to adjust to the more rapid pace, but working with that team was a career high point for every person involved. A last thought I'll add from my own experience as pair programming and as a manager is that compassion and empathy are also important components of maintaining a beginner's mind. Every person has their strengths and weaknesses. None of us are perfect. Making the effort to understand not only your coworkers' abilities, but to also relate to their perspective and put yourself in their shoes will not only help give them a good experience working with you, but will help you grow as well and experience another aspect of the many possibilities of the beginner's mind. Thank you. Here are those links again, how you can find me online and a link to the slides. I'm available for questions if you want to come up after the talk or you can find me around the conference anytime today or tomorrow. I have some swag up here also. I have some Fast Ruby uh, bottle opener keychain. And thank you again.